got it, we got it. Good work. In the late 1990s, beneath Seattle's skyline. Pretty much out of nowhere, this influx of sharks appeared. And we knew nothing about them. One of the world's largest and most elusive sharks unexpectedly appeared. Basically looking at a living dinosaur. There was no knowledge of, of these animals whatsoever other than that they existed. What could their sudden arrival mean? And how would it alter the ecosystem? Scientists began to investigate, but they had to act fast. So sharks throughout the system were disappearing. Vanished. As suddenly as they had appeared. Understanding what happened to them could be critical to shark conservation efforts worldwide. To find answers, researchers ventured into the depths to unravel the mystery behind the sharks of Seattle. jagged northwest corner of the continental United States, where the mighty Pacific wages war against a rugged and forbidding coastline. An arm of this untamed force reaches into the state of Washington. This is Puget Sound, one of the world's richest inland seas. As a biologist for the Seattle Aquarium, Jeff Christensen knows these waters better than almost anyone. I've been diving with, you know, Pacific Northwest animals all of my life. He's logged thousands of hours below the surface and encountered a vast array of exotic creatures. But nothing could prepare him for the strangers who appeared on the scene in the late 1990s. One of the largest ocean predators, the six-gill shark, began haunting the shallows of Puget Sound. They call them charismatic megafauna, and for a good reason. That was one of the real exciting things, to come up after a scuba dive, having encountered this rare animal found in the deep ocean, and be right here on Seattle's central waterfront. Had Seattle, a pulsing metropolis of more than three and a half million, become a mecca for six-gill sharks? The very idea seemed impossible right here on Seattle's central waterfront. People visiting the aquarium could be standing on the end of the pier and have a 12-foot shark swimming around underneath them without them even knowing it. What made the arrival of these creatures even more astonishing was the fact that large predators throughout the oceans were vanishing. Humans kill as many as 270 million sharks each year. That's almost equal to the entire population of the United States. Because they grow slowly and have relatively few offspring, they can't keep pace with the demand. As a result, some shark populations have fallen by up to 70%. But in Puget Sound, 
these massive animals had emerged seemingly out of nowhere and in big numbers. You know, we knew there were more shark sightings going on, but we didn't know what was driving it. Speculation was all over the place. Some of the guesses were like, the sharks were associated with salmon runs. Changing ocean conditions have brought the sharks to us. Uh, uh, pollution has done something with the sharks. Today's players, Chris Van Dam is dive captain. Katie Hart's gonna be deco captain, and that's the dive team. I'll be dive coordinator. Christensen and the team at the aquarium would spend the next 15 years searching for answers. They would become some of the world's leading six skill experts. Based on divers' ears and based on where you want things to go. One thing was certain, large predators have outsized impacts on food webs. And whatever the team learned about these sharks would have implications for the greater ecosystem. And perhaps more importantly, it could inform shark conservation efforts worldwide. But scientists weren't the first to discover the six skills of Puget Sound. The initial sightings were made by a different group of underwater explorers. The dive community has been essential to this research from the very get-go. They are our eyes and ears, and they're becoming, for us, citizen scientists. The Northwest has some of the finest scuba diving on the planet with one of the greatest concentrations of year-round divers. Cold Pacific currents feed this lush underwater world. Well, every time we went out, we wanted to go a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, see what there was to see. Everything is just incredibly richly colorful and covered with life. You never know what you're going to see. We dropped down to about 120 feet. All of a sudden, we saw this huge, giant Pacific octopus coming along the wall towards us. And he looked odd. He got up close to us, and we realized he was missing all eight of his legs. And we saw a shadow coming from the shallow side. And my heart started thumping. And all of a sudden, I heard my buddy suddenly going, oh, 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 you know, into his regulator. And I turned to see what was the matter with him. And there was a shark right here, coming right through the center of us. And I, it looked like watching a truck go underneath me. Um, they are the size of a, of a great white. And I realized I'm seeing my first six kill shark. They're big, they're big sharks. You're, you're with a, an animal that in some cases, twice the size of you, that if it chose to do so, it could take you out in a second and have you for lunch. If I tell somebody about interacting with sharks right there in Elliott Bay, people are like, no, that doesn't exist. Like, oh, yes, it does. Word of Seattle's six skill phenomenon soon spread, with divers and photographers traveling from around the world for a glimpse of these rare animals. Whenever a diver reports that, you know, I saw a six gill, suddenly there's an influx of divers heading out that way because everybody wants to see them. It seemed like every night there was a sighting of a six gill. It seemed like you couldn't get in the water and not see them. So you would just run into people at the I-beams just sitting there staring out into the water because we're all looking for the same thing, right? <laughs> Suddenly there's this huge meat-eating thing coming towards you and, and the adrenaline just courses through your whole body. I could hear my heart beating out of my chest. You want to see it, but you're afraid to see it. And then once you see them and you, you just become fascinated with the way they're swimming and that fear just goes away. Now all of a sudden, it's just blissful. You're just there with a beautiful shark watching them swim. Every once in a while, you'll see the eye and it'll just turn and you stare right at the camera as if to say, why are you here? What are you doing? Well, you know, kind of a curious 
expression, it would just give me that look like, like this, you know, like what? As shark sightings increased, government and university researchers began their own investigations. Pretty much out of nowhere, this influx of sharks appeared, and we knew nothing about them. What do they eat? We don't know. How long do they live? We don't know. How fast do they grow? Couldn't tell you. Um, do they stay in one place, or do they move all over the place? Who knows? This is not like a tiny animal. This is a big animal. And I couldn't even tell you anything about the basic biology. What is known about six gills is that they can reach up to 16 feet in length and weigh more than 1,000 pounds. They take their name from the six gill slits on each side of their head, a characteristic of prehistoric sharks. These large predators roam the deep ocean, spending their lives in darkness thousands of feet below the surface. Their entire life history in the deep ocean is pretty well undocumented. Although they've been found in oceans around the world, encountering them in shallow water is extremely rare. There's only a handful of locations around the world where they're seen in shallower locations. Early on, there was so little known that we wanted to just start with the basic work. We were just trying to answer simple questions. Why are these sharks here? What are they doing? Just as scientists began drawing up research plans, a new threat emerged. Fishers began catching six gills from the piers around Seattle. I had heard as part of my weekly fishing report that there was an angler down on the Seacrest Pier in West Seattle, right down Seattle basically, that had learned how to catch six gill sharks, big ones, you know. I mean, we knew and they were out there. They were kind of this mysterious creature that no one ever caught or really encountered. Um, so when he started catching them, it was like, wow, that's interesting. We wrote a very short story saying this guy was catching sharks off the Seacrest Pier. This is the first time six gill sharks really came to almost everybody's public attention here in the Northwest. The next morning I returned to work and uh, my email inbox was loaded with um, kind of nasty emails from divers. It turns out um, scuba divers had been swimming with these sharks and they were upset that this guy was catching and killing these sharks. He was very successful at catching a number of sharks in a very short period of time. And at the very same time, shark sightings at that dive site dropped off to zero. Very little, as it turns out, was known about the population of six gill sharks in Puget Sound. And they were worried that it might lead to an over-harvest situation or might harm the population. And they were angry at me for publicizing it. At the time, it was perfectly legal. There was no uh, fisheries protections or regulations on the six gill shark at all in place. It was pretty much open season on them. Scientists worried the sharks would be fished out before they had a chance to study them. And divers feared fishing would wipe them out completely. On the waterfront, relations between divers and fishers grew hostile. It was pretty tense. Um, there was a lot of name calling and uh, it was very confrontational. When the fishing occurred, uh, we drafted a letter to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife asking for a closure to the fishery, uh, fishery on six gill sharks. The dive community just came out in full force and hundreds, if not thousands of people called and said, hey, you need to close this fishery, this isn't right. In the summer of 2000, state officials suspended all six gill fishing in Puget Sound. With protections in place, the aquarium could begin its research. But answering even the simplest questions would prove difficult. For starters, scientists would have to find this large, free-ranging shark in a water body the size of Rhode Island. Where do you begin the search in an area that big? We had dived underneath the Seattle Aquarium for many, many, many years and never saw six gill sharks. But if fishers could catch them with bait, maybe scientists could too. The aquarium researchers decided to place bait in the water beneath the aquarium in hopes of attracting sharks. In the fall of 2001, they made their first attempt. The down Right. 
Seven foot, copy that, seven foot. Tell Shark just hit me in the head, swam around to my left. Have they left the area? Sharks are here. The sharks are feeding, is that what you said? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> you can hear the shark right there, guys. We got it, we got it, we got great footage. Before the end of the dive, so about 30 minutes into it, we already had a six gill. That's how many there were here. It's just difficult to explain the awe you feel when you're underwater face to face with these large animals swimming in front of you. It's, it's a heart thumping moment. Tim, that was so fun. That was great. Jeff, that was amazing. Else that behind me, something whacks me in the back with a fancy. Look off to my left. There's a big tail going. <laughs> <Good stuff. laughs> I think we proved the concept. The baitings were such a success that they became the cornerstone of the aquarium's research. Let's do our lung hose. Check. You don't have to put it on until we get out there, just so you'll be able to breathe, but I want you to make sure you verify that it's breathing okay. Yeah. Check. Divers are five minutes from walking. We're gonna need two. They began placing bait in the water below the aquarium in hopes the sharks would pick up the scent. This was a chance to study a shark right on our doorstep. We didn't have to go out into the field. We didn't have to go to the bottom of the ocean. The sharks would come to us. Camera four is on bottom. Light three may be slightly above bottom. Roger that. Go ahead and uh, deploy bait. Attracting six gills required loads of food. Well, the action is really going to pick up when they put the fresh bait inside the basket. Fresh salmon carcasses, salmon, halibut, maybe even dogfish. And sometimes, that brought uninvited guests. Can you find the shark? Visitors to the aquarium took notice. What is he eating? We're actively studying them. That's what built this research station. People would sit there and stand in front of that screen for up to an hour, just on the hopes that a shark would swim by. That's when the light bulb went off, that we really need to showcase this work for our guests at the aquarium. The exhibit worked to dispel the myth that sharks are man-eating monsters. Despite the six gills' impressive size, they pose little threat to humans. No unprovoked attacks have ever been recorded. At the peak of our shark research, we had up to 40 different animals present on a single evening event. This was the equivalent of having sharks drive down the street to your lab and just go into the tanks on their own. It was great. It seemed like this unprecedented opportunity would go on forever. Scientists had no way of knowing that they were in a race against time. While the aquarium was conducting its first-of-a-kind research, a group of recreational divers out in Puget Sound began their own informal studies of six gills. Rob Holman has been diving these waters for decades. I've always loved sharks. I remember as a child reading a book called Shark Lady by Eugene Clark. She was a marine biologist. Read it probably a hundred times. When he heard of the sightings, he had to see for himself. The opportunity to see such a large creature uh, is just, you know, amazing. And for a few glorious months in 2007, they were amazed. In the beginning, you know, we might see one shark uh, in an evening, and then pretty soon, within 20 minutes of dropping it, we'd have, you know, three, four, and five different six gills coming in. One time, uh, it was just crazy. You know, we had them everywhere. And they discovered something unexpected. They could identify individual sharks by their unique personalities. We started recognizing the same sharks coming back over and over again. We named them because we could tell which were which because they had different personalities and they had different marks on them. We had one that had a really long scar on her side and then two white spots on her head. Her, we called her Spotty. She was uh, very docile, very agreeable. You know, we always liked to see Spotty. Spotty was a good shark. We had another one that we called Fluffy that had these kind of fluffy spots. Her, her attitude was anything but fluffy. We called her the devil shark, and whenever she came by, we just did the devil shark sign, and, and then we knew it was, uh, Fluffy was, was coming. 
Fluffy was not a shark to uh, be messed with. She did a 360 all the way around me and then she turned in real hard. And I gave her a, a tap on, on the nose with a pole, just a, just a little bump. And usually that's enough to send the shark off. They almost like, oh, excuse me, and they'll kind of swim off in another direction. You know you have a big shark when you put your stick up against the shark to push it away and the shark doesn't move but you push yourself away. Um, that, that, that's when you know you have a big one. And the biggest sick skill of them all would become the fish of legend. She's about 14 feet long. She's the girth of a couch. We started to refer to her as Blondie because of how pretty her, her skin was. She wasn't scratched up. She was a shark of mythical proportions. If she were near you, you knew there was something in the water with you. She was a local icon that, uh, oh, you, you say the word Blondie to a diver who's been diving for 10 or 15 years, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Blondie patrolled the bay like she was in charge. I had one experience with Blondie where uh, she came up and swam out of the darkness, out of the depths, and I think she made three or four passes, and one of them was quite close. She, I think, was just letting everybody know that if you want to dive here in West Seattle, you can, but you answer to me. When Blondie was in the water, she was the apex. Uh, Apex predator. <laughs> Little did anyone suspect that Blondie might one day be key to unraveling the mystery of the six gills sudden appearance in Puget Sound. As divers came to recognize the prominent sharks, researchers at the aquarium wanted to identify all the local six gills. Two months, two years later, if the shark comes back, I need to be able to say, this is the same shark. We can't count them if we can't identify them. So we're taking that standard fisheries tag and adding geometric shapes to it so that we can identify the individual shark. So what I did was a triangle, triangle, rectangle, rectangle. It lets us recognize individual sharks quickly and from a distance. This gets placed underneath the shark's skin and streams away like that. The tags could help scientists figure out the population size and how it changed over time. Come on, boy, here, sharky, 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 sharky. Divers waited for sharks to swim close, then tagged them and took tissue samples for analysis. Our goal was to tag as many sharks as possible, but it was really up to the sharks whether they got tagged or not. They have very tough skin, but I really had to overcome my uh, caution for not wanting to damage the shark. You had to hit them pretty hard in order to get the tag to be able to pierce their skin and launch in place. Now we got tissue on circle, circle, circle. Copy that, very nice. With tags in place, they began to notice surprising behaviors. We saw that many of these sharks were traveling in small, persistent groups. Two or three sharks that looked like they were traveling together at the same time. Sharks that we're seeing in February that looked like it might have been the same sharks we saw in June. Some shark species hunt in packs. Could that be what Jeff and the team were seeing? Out in the sound, another team of investigators began gathering clues about the six skills movements. Well, we could go over, you know, right by Salties and drop in where we saw them last time. Biologists yeah. Phil Levin 
and Kelly Andrews are experts in animal movement. They'd tracked salmon and other fish, but nothing as large or complex as a shark. So this will go down about 15 feet and be listening on the bottom there. These sharks were not even on our radar as an important component of the Puget Sound food web. But once fishermen started catching them from piers and divers are seeing them in 60 feet of water, it became pretty clear that they were pretty common and could be important. Head right over there, okay? They wanted to uncover where these sharks lived okay. and what role they played in the Puget Sound ecosystem. Okay, just run them right through. Okay. They teamed up with State Fish and Wildlife and University of Washington okay. researchers. Okay. The shark coming, one in the waiting room. This was the first time scientists in Puget Sound tried to catch and release six gills. Two, three, six. We didn't really know whether we were going to have a hard time finding these sharks. And then, to our surprise, I mean, we were able to catch these sharks pretty easily. You want to do this one? Sometimes we would catch four or five. Um, there was one day I, that I remember where we caught nine, and those are all in downtown Seattle. To bring up this animal and to see how common they were and to realize that we knew nothing about them was just a, a, an incredible experience. Okay, let's get, this, let's get a weight. This a female, we decided? And isn't she a beauty? I know. Every time we captured a shark to tag it, we took all sorts of samples. 97? We would uh, measure the fish and try to get some genetic information and see males and females. Most, if not all, of these sharks were sort of juveniles or sub-adult sharks, although they were still 8 to 10 feet long. I mean, these were big animals. All right, we're ready? We're ready. Dr. Katz and Dr. Katz, right. handsome chief of surgery at the hospital, reaches forward. They implanted radio transmitters so researchers could track the animals. You're a detective trying to piece together little bits of information to tell the story of this animal's life. Let's get down, please. Sharks are resilient creatures that heal quickly. And these six gills would soon return to their old haunts. To get a more detailed picture of where the animals were hanging out, Phil and Kelly used a specialized underwater microphone to listen for the sharks. Some large sharks are known to travel dozens of miles a day, so the researchers were prepared for a long search. Once one of those transmitters is detected, then you'll hear these, this train of pings. And it'll go ping, 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 ping. What they found defied all expectations. We were surprised at how easy it was to find a shark. We would put our boat in the water and within 15, 20 minutes, we would hear the pinging of, of a shark. Researchers soon discovered something strange. The sharks were clustered in areas about the size of a golf course. We sort of expected when we first started this work to be really tracking a shark, you know, through the channel of, of Puget Sound. But as it turned out, they just did not go anywhere. Right here in downtown Seattle in Elliott Bay, this was a, like the center of the six gill shark abundance. I mean, right here, right downtown, big sharks and a lot of them. Why, you know, why are they here? We would track these sharks and they would basically stay where we found them. They would kind of move around the waterfront of Seattle, um, but they wouldn't leave. And you know, sometimes that got monotonous for us, just driving back and forth. Researchers believe that Puget Sound's rich ecosystem played a role in what they were seeing. So there was probably plenty of food for it to take advantage of. It didn't need to go long distances to find food. But a sedentary shark is also a vulnerable one. So it would be very easy to wipe out a small population. And when you wiped it out, you're wiping out the future reproductive capacity of an area. 
Could this be why the sharks around the fishing pier vanished? I think part of the lesson from the six gills is that conservation, marine conservation, is not in some remote area in the middle of the tropics. We need to think about conservation everywhere. Worldwide consumption of sharks has been on a steady incline since the 1950s and has increased more than 150% since 2000. Asia's appetite for shark fins is one of the biggest drivers of global demand. Shark fin soup is a prized delicacy. A bowl can cost upwards of $100. This has led to unsustainable levels of fishing and widespread poaching. Millions of sharks have their fins cut off while they're still alive and are then discarded and left to die. Sharks sit atop the food web. When they disappear, their prey can grow out of control. And in turn, the animals they eat become scarce. A drop in shark populations can destabilize whole ecosystems, causing fisheries to shut down. One quarter of the ocean's shark and ray species are currently threatened with extinction. Six gills are near threatened. But because they're so rarely seen and little studied, no one knows how many actually exist. Sean Larson has made it her mission to find out. Larson is a scientist at the Seattle Aquarium and studies the genetics of marine animals. I just had a completely open mind because I really didn't know what I was going to find. Humans have more than 20,000 genes. Six scales are believed to be equally complex, but unlike the human genome, which has been studied extensively, little is known about this shark's genetic makeup. Nobody sequenced the whole six gill genome, so we don't know exactly how large it is. Sean was the first to attempt to crack the six gills genetic code, information that could be used to estimate six gill populations worldwide. I just had a completely open mind because I really didn't know what I was going to find. In cold storage in Sean's lab are all the tissue samples the team gathered over the years. The hundreds of samples are the keys to unlocking the shark's biology. Within each shark, we get then a unique genetic signature called their genetic fingerprint, which is as unique as a human fingerprint or a human eye or anything like that that distinguishes individuals from each other. By looking closely at the genetic fingerprints, Sean noticed an astonishing pattern. Most of the Puget Sound six gills were related. They were brothers and sisters or half brothers and half sisters. Based on the little pieces of the genome that we looked at, that's what it's telling us. They're siblings. They're just hanging out together, um, which is just bizarre. Scientists had already figured out that most of the sharks were juveniles. And now they discovered they were related. It all pointed to one thing. Our region might be an important nursery for the six gill shark. Nursery areas are critical to shark survival. And these young six gills seem to be thriving. Puget Sound provided a safe haven with an abundant food supply. They probably stay in a related group because that's where they were born. But then over time, we would think that they would move away from each other. Some researchers guessed these juveniles were learning how to find food and survive from each other. You know, a lot of animals that stay together get benefits as um, if they're in a group, they get benefits from group protection and also a group of animals with multiple eyes and multiple senses is able to find food probably better than an individual. So maybe they're benefiting that way from staying in a group together. Or sharks may simply enjoy spending time together. Sharks have long been thought of as solitary killing machines. 
But new research has revealed that when certain species of sharks cluster in large groups, they do so not only for survival, but because they're social creatures seeking companionship. One thing still puzzled the researchers. If the six gills were born here, why hadn't anyone seen babies or pregnant females? Then, in the spring of 2007, they got another clue, a big one. This, you know, 14 foot long shark was on the beach and that's when you really understand, oh wow, those were just babies that we were tagging and now here's this 14 foot long shark on the beach um, that's what an, an adult looks like. That was the first thing that popped into my mind was, uh, I, wow, I hope that's not Blondie. The shark's size and coloring led some divers to conclude it was Blondie. As soon as I saw the news footage, I knew that was her, you could tell. Closer examination revealed an even bigger secret. And there was 82, I think, um, three foot long, pups in it, just stacked like sardines. Amazing. Obviously a very pregnant female about ready to give birth, and there were several pups on the beach next to her. We think, you know, she was probably, had expended a lot of energy, she was ready to give birth, and then the tide just went out, and she got stuck on the beach and, and died. None of the pups survived. They were brought to the Burke Museum at the University of Washington to be studied. So the first thing we're going to do is get a good length measurement. 660 millimeters. Most shark species have only a handful of babies, but six gills are the exception. Well, the cool thing about these guys is the number of pups that a female can have. So up to 108 pups per litter, which is just incredible. Tissue samples indicated that the mother had likely come from Southern California or Mexico. The fact that there was an adult coming into Puget Sound and that she was pregnant just showed us that yes, this is a nursery ground. If a couple of females came in, each of them had pups and had 80 or 100 pups, we could have had several hundred sharks just from those couple of females. It was a remarkable discovery that seemed to confirm scientists' suspicions. Pregnant six gills were coming in from the open ocean to give birth. This meant Puget Sound could be the world's first documented nursery for six gills. Scientists don't know how many more of these nurseries might exist, but they say identifying and protecting them is essential to the survival of shark species worldwide. The presence of so many juvenile sharks was a boon for research. The animals seemed ready to yield even more of their long-held secrets. And then, in the spring of 2008, everything changed. We could not catch a single shark. We were quite surprised. We went from seeing 40 sharks at a shark research event to maybe seeing three sharks or two sharks or even one or zero sharks. This was a change, a big change. We were expecting to still be up to our armpits in sharks. At the same time that we saw a decline, the same thing was occurring in the diving community. So sharks throughout the system were disappearing. It was pretty quick. It was all of a sudden there was just, you know, a drop off of sightings or reported sightings. What had caused the sharks? to suddenly vanish. In fact, this wasn't the first time large numbers of six gills had gone missing. Just a few years before the Seattle disappearance, a population of six gills around Vancouver Island vanished in similar fashion. The coastal waters of British Columbia are some of the richest and most biodiverse in the world. Few people know that better than Rob Zielinski and his wife Amanda. They run a dive business off the east coast of Vancouver Island. Rob's family pioneered diving in these parts. 
I started diving when I was about seven or eight years old. I grew up in a diving family and um, I just started as soon as I was able to handle the equipment. I started diving and uh, operating boats and I've done that my whole life. In the 1970s, the Zelinskis were among the first to discover that six gills were frequenting these waters. This is Flora Islet, which is where we had the majority of our six-gill sightings over the years. I personally got to see, you know, many dozens, if not hundreds of sharks here over the years. On the first dive, I saw three, and then, you know, the next dive, I saw seven, and it was just like that. It was just all the time and very, very common and, and pretty easy to do. You would put on your stuff and drop down to 70 feet and they would be there. This is it, the, the sharks would have been right under the boat. This is one of the few places outside of Puget Sound where divers could encounter six gills. The sharks became a celebrated attraction. Oh, for the business, it was a big draw. I mean, it was a very special thing they'll come and swim with a six gill. We would usually say to our groups that on any given day, on any given dive, someone in a group would have a very good chance of seeing one. April 1999, six gill shark getaway. People would travel from around the world for a glimpse of these sharks. But by the mid 2000s, the odds were no longer in the divers' favor. Our sightings just started declining, sort of a, a slow, steady decline, and then quite abruptly, our sightings just dropped right off. We still see the odd animal, but it's nowhere as close to the uh, abundance that we did before. Some speculate the sharks were a casualty of commercial fishing. Others think changes to the marine environment may be to blame, but no one knows for certain. It would be wonderful to start seeing them as divers again, but um, my biggest hope would be that they're actually still alive as a, as a species in this area, that we haven't completely just wiped them out of this area and they've ceased to exist. What happened to the six scales of the Northwest? Their disappearance remained a mystery. Back in Seattle, Researchers Phil Some Levin answer. and Kelly Andrews scoured the tracking data for answers. I mean, they all left at different times of the year. I mean, every time we'd launch the boat, we'd put our receivers in, you know, we're getting pings from the sharks right in this area. Pretty yeah. much every single one of our tracks is going right along the water front and back, right along the water front and back. Maybe out not here. Really, not so much across, right? Yeah, nothing through the middle. It's always right along the edges of the of the bay. They traced the path of the animals that gathered around yeah, Seattle's so waterfront in and in the mid-2000s noticed a dramatic change in behavior. So at first we're seeing movements like from here to here or mm -hmm. here to here and now we're talking about in the, in the space of just a few weeks really, right? We're talking going from here all the way out to the straits which ends up leading to the ocean. Yes. They were clearly going faster than before and in much more of a straight line. So they weren't just meandering, they were swimming someplace. You know, that was sort of our first hint that, whoa, something just happened with these sharks. The sharks started swimming greater distances. It was as if they were building up for a long journey. Then, one by one, they headed north out of Seattle and away from central Puget Sound to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and then out to the ocean. Some turned left and went down to California, some turned right and went up to British Columbia, but it was clear that they were, they were off on their adult life into the Pacific Ocean. The exodus continued for several months until all the tagged sharks were gone. We sort of ended our research because there were no no animals to easily do this do this work on. 
Phil and Kelly believe that when the young six gills reached a certain size, something triggered them to leave Puget Sound and venture into the open ocean. Basically, they go off the, the continental shelf and go into deep waters, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 meters deep. And we think this group of babies were growing up in Puget Sound, and as they left Puget Sound, there weren't more to replace them. The discovery provided a possible explanation for why sharks disappeared, not just from Puget Sound, but from Vancouver Island as well. This may be a totally natural pattern where, you know, the adults come in, they give birth, and then don't return for several years. There's compelling evidence that this is the case. But until sharks return, questions will remain. It's really a, gr a great question as to whether these animals will be coming back to the same waters that they were, grew up in to give birth. Uh, that would be a fantastic piece to add to the puzzle. They will come back. I just don't know when. It's been nearly a decade since divers regularly encountered six gills in these waters. But people like Rob Holman continue to search. It'll be a chilly one. Uh, which way are we drifting? We're kind of drifted in, aren't we? It's the wind that we're going to be concerned yeah, with. Yeah, so I need to get out a little bit. There have been a few six kill shinings at, uh, at the, one of the dive sites in the, in the nearby area, so. Um, you know, we've, we're a little bit down current of that, so we're hoping to draw some in. What do you guys think the chances are that you see a shark tonight? i give it about 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Out of the corner of my eye, I, I saw uh, a light flashing, and it was, I, I believe it was my buddy Jeff, you know, kind of pointing out that there was a, a shark coming in. And you see one kind of a ghostly shape coming in and, and working its way towards the, the chum pile. So it wasn't one of the big, massive, you know, Goliaths, but it was a, a real healthy, respectable shark. And it came in, and it just did a circle, and it left. I think we had like three or four sightings over the course of the evening, and it may have been two or three different sharks. Oh, it's just like, wow, it worked, you know? It's, uh, it still, still works. <laughs> awesome. The little guy was cute. Divers have been reporting new sightings around Puget Sound. It's, it's nice to see him again, you know? It's been such a dry period for so long that People weren't seeing him that much, and uh, it's just, it was encouraging uh, to see him come back in. It's too soon to say if a new generation of six skills has emerged, but recent sightings have stirred hope. It's incredibly encouraging. You know, there was a couple of sightings, and everybody's getting their gear together and going, heading back out. I did. starting to see the early phase of an, uh, another batch of sharks moving in. Uh, I'm hopeful, but I'm skeptical until the numbers support it. The story of the six scales is the story of the oceans themselves and how much we have left to learn. For if a shark this large can hide in the heart of a major city, what other wonders lie beneath the surface? 
with sharks and other creatures rapidly disappearing. Will we discover their secrets before it's too late?